A Christmas Carol has over 30 screen adaptations. Pride and Prejudice has over 13. So what about... Oliver Goldsmith's A Vicar of Wakefield. Now, this book has actually been adapted for the screen five times, but all of them before the invention of sound. The last one, a full length one, was in 1917. So what is it about that book that hasn't really grasped TV and film studios? Well, let's look at the story. It's about a lovable, charming vicar who lives in Wakefield with his family, who are also lovable and charming and gullible. And they believe in God, of course, and they believe in the goodness of the world and the goodness of their fellow man. And so their fellow man diddles them five ways straight. They also believe in the goodness of a sort of peculiar squire who may or may not be in charge of most of the diddling. At the end, the vicar's lost everything. He's lost his eldest son, who's gone off somewhere. He's lost his daughter, who's been ruined. He's lost his family and his money, and he's been put in prison. And yet he still believes in the goodness of God, and the goodness of the world, and the goodness of people. And this pulls him through, and... Well, let's say then it gets a little ridiculous. It may be that the Vicar of Wakefield doesn't have the snark of Pride and Prejudice. Nor does it have the ghost and action of A Christmas Carol. Nor does it have those big Dickensian characters. But there is an argument that the Vicar of Wakefield and that Goldsmith's writing in general is in fact a genius kind of satire. This book here, The True Genius of Oliver Goldsmith, and a number of books like it, argue that there are two kinds of satire. There's hard satire, of which Swift is the king, and there's soft satire, of which Goldsmith is the king. And that The Vicar of Wakefield is actually a genius piece of soft satire. I've also read in uh, The Brotherhood of the Quill by Norma Clarke that it could well be that this book talks a lot about the relationship between Ireland and England. And that the family and The Vicar of Goldsmith are Ireland. They're nice, they're sweet, they hold forth to, to their religion and they get diddled by the world, represented by England. And yet their sweetness never gives up. And that it's kind of that power play that existed, especially then between Ireland and England. I'm not totally convinced by these. I think there is a little bit in The Vicar of Goldsmith that is sort of sharp and satirical because Goldsmith himself was a funny guy. Often a funny guy his friends just didn't understand the comedy of. But there is a sweetness in this as well. And uh, I don't think that that would be too bad for a TV adaptation. There is a spot for sweetness on TV. ITV ran Darling Buds of May for three years. And it was a much loved, very warm, sweet story about a family living in the 1950s. They ran Heartbeat for almost 20 years. The BBC has had recent successes with Lark Rise to Candleford and called the midwife. In America, Little House of the Prairie ran for almost 10 years. Now, I think they could do something with this, especially on the Sunday night. They could either retell it in two, three episodes and just leave it at that, or they could do what they did with Lark Rise, which was take the situation and the characters, take some of the bits out of the book and then invent others. And then so every week is a new kind of event happening to this hapless family and how they get through it with their love for each other and maybe not their faith in God, that wouldn't really fly on British television but their faith in humanity and I think it would be very warm, it would be very sweet and it would be very loved if they wanted they could sneak in some of that soft satire we were talking about earlier but as it stands there aren't any adaptations of this with sound and so if you want to experience this book, which is like, hmm, it's like a lovely holiday with some good people and some laughs and sometimes some sadness. We'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. And I've no problem with that. 
I was ever of the opinion that the honest man who married and brought up a large family did more service than he who continued single and only talked to population. From this motive I had scarce taken orders a year before, I began to think seriously of matrimony, and chose my wife as she did her wedding gown, not for a fine glossy surface, but for such qualities as would wear well. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs>